Interesting. Okay, so one of the things that I hear a lot just around the internet is um, people will constantly like meme with the Tiger One's transmission as though the transmission is like a problematic or unreliable. And in this book, you bring you break down the Allies testing and evaluation of the Tiger One part by part, and there's an, even a section on the transmission. So can we talk a little bit about to the folks about what was the Tiger One's transmission? actually in terms of performance and reliability yeah so uh the transmission is is a fascinating technology it's actually um it's it's got so many dimensions to it if you start exploring the transmission you will find um a counterintelligence failure on the british side so it's originally a british technology that gets stolen by the germans uh around 1939 <laughs> and the british don't know until they identify the technology in a in a captured wreck of a tiger and it actually takes them a while to identify what to, to confirm what the technology is because it's it's been demolished and um, the at first superficially the technology is not identifiable uh, so but it, it's it's a breakthrough technology so it's actually the first introduction of a regenerative differential steering unit. So up, up to that point, all the German tanks had clutch and brake steering and um, and and, uh, and manual, uh, the, actually some of the, the Czech tanks, uh, Panzer 35, 30, 38Ts, they, they had a um, effectively a semi-automatic gear change mechanism. So it's, it's, it's a pneumatic powered, pneumatic meaning compressed air, powered change speed mechanism. It's a pre-selector. Actually, and this was a British technology too. Uh, not stolen, right? So it's licensed and then and then incorporated into uh, later peacetime designs in the in Czech designs. Uh, it's semi-automatic, so it's pre-selector. So you'd, you'd you'd select your gear and then you would punch a pedal which is like a clutch to tell the system to uh, then engage that gear. So it's semi-automatic in that sense. You pre-select your gear and then you tell the system and it it takes over the actual changing of the gear. So in, in theory, that's a more reliable and quicker system. Um, so the Germans had clutch and brake and this pre-selector technology up to Tiger. And then Tiger comes through with, um, with the, with the regenerative differential steering instead of clutch and brake steering. And it has an eight speed pre-selector. So it's semi-automatic pre-selector. And all, all the controls I'm talking about, and, and, and I should add that steering wheel too, everything's power assisted. Hmm. Everything's either hydraulic or pneumatic power assisted. So the Tiger is the easiest drive of all the tanks of the Second World War. It's the easiest to drive. And, and, and again, that, that dispels the myth that this was a clumsy vehicle. It was actually very agile because of this sophisticated steering system. So very agile, very easy to drive. But of course, the stereotype is it's just big, big, it's a big, heavy tank, and you're going to have to wrestle with it as a driver. That's not true. You've got a power-assisted steering wheel. Right? Couldn't be easier, right? So you just, just turn the steering wheel, and the the... Hydraulic system is going to tell the regenerative steering system what to do, and then it automatically regenerates power on one side and takes away power from the other. And, and all you're doing as a driver, you're just steering the, steering the steering wheel like a power-assisted car. So, so fantastic. Right? Imagine, imagine in 1942, you're a German tanker. <laughs> it's gone from clutch and brake steering wheels, where, where you're mechanically, you're, you have to use a lot of muscular force really do the tight turns so is this true this is still true on on the british tanks of the time like the like the valentine which is a much lighter tank it still takes so i've driven valentine it still takes a lot of force right uh you, you get a workout um uh so so the driver's tiger driver steering a steering wheel you got a pre-selector on his right so imagine this is the the gear stick um he's got eight speeds he's just going to do a nice little gate change. So here's the gate that is that is controlling where the gear stick goes. You know, it's got a nice little gear gear uh, gate to go around. So it just puts it in there. You know, do that with one finger. Uh, some user reports saying how they used to drive with one finger, like one finger on the steering wheel, 
just to, not not tactically, but just to demonstrate how easy it is. One finger on the gear change. A punches a pedal, automatically changes gear, your eight gears. Um, and uh, so you've got change speed, you've got your driving, you've got, um, uh, you've got your steering. Um, uh, so, 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 so you've got, you've got easy, easy transmission, uh, and the unit, I should say, this is, this is another innovation, the unit, the steering unit and the gear, the speed change or the uh, change speed system are integrated in the same unit, which is held at the front of the hull, uh, between the driver on the left and the machine gunner on the right, whole machine gunner on the right. Um, so one unit. So if you have any failing in that unit, you're going to open up that unit, uh, which is tricky in any tank. Um, and you're going to open up that unit and you're going to work on that unit uh, uh, within the tank. Um, it's beautifully packaged, which saves you space. So there's a lot of innovations in, in this system. Um, and there's no evidence that it was particularly unreliable, right? So there's no, again, there's, the users are not complaining that this is unreliable. It is true when the Panther tank comes out with the same technology, it actually has slightly different unit. So this combined steering gear change unit, it's a slightly different unit, it's the same technology. Panther has a lot of uh, steering failures uh, early on because it's more front loaded. Um, and uh, those the robustness of the geared connections into the final drive, they have to be they have to be improved, um, but, but it's the technology that everybody adopts. That's the right technology, and it's the Germans who introduce it first, and yet it's a British technology that was developed in the late 1930s. And it's the Germans who steal it, and they introduce it first in 1942. On the British, I'm laughing, but it's not funny, right? It's not funny if you're on the British side looking at, <laughs> that's our technology, and it's in the Tiger Tank. Understood. Great. Okay, so we covered a little bit about um, the mobility of the Tiger and its power to rate ratio, and we talked a little bit about its reliability with regard to breakdowns and overhauls, and then we talked a little bit about the transmission and its purported reliability, which is actually not so. One of the other things with regard to reliability that I heard and that somebody from the Discord asked is having to do with the road wheels. So you see different school schools of thought. I'm going to put thought in quotation marks, but schools of thought with regard to the interleaved road wheel system being too complex or, you know, the road wheels being too heavy, it's difficult to maintain, or it will, if something goes wrong, you have to remove everything, it takes forever. But obviously, I think that the best way to sort of to look into that would be to look into it as you have from the crew experience and the crew ports and as well from the design side. And I noticed that there is a section here about the wheels of yeah. the Tiger one. Yeah, well, I, I try to be thorough, so I have a section on the wheels themselves. So there's there's a few things, uh, there's a few design choices that the Germans made deliberately um, with the wheels. Uh, and, and wheels are easy to neglect. So you you might think that all wheels are the same, um, but but I mean, let's look at look at the choices the the Germans made. So these are big we wheels. They're big wheels, right? So there's only the only the Panther tank actually has bigger wheels in this war. Um, they're, they're, you want large wheels because because it reduces rolling re resistance. So bigger wheels, less rolling resistance. You should get smoother travel, and you should get uh, you should need less power from the engine to make those wheels roll to get them going. Right? So less rolling resistance. So that's good. Um, now the wheels are. Uh, if you choose big wheels, right, there's a material cost to that. And then the Germans chose interleaved wheels, which means you get more wheels. You're packing more wheels into uh, a, uh, into the same space. So there's a material cost to that too. But why would they do that? Because if you're interleaving wheels, you're, you're reducing the gap between peaks of pressure. So... In many tanks of the time, this is still true for a lot of tanks now, right? So if you if you think of a, a widely spaced wheel design, such as the early cruisers, cruiser three and four, which had four big wheels and they have massive gaps between the wheels. What that means is you get high peaks of pressure under the wheels because those wheels are not spreading. The track is unable to spread the weight that is transmitted through those wheels 
perfectly. So you're getting slack in the track between those wheels. And you're getting high peaks of pressure. And when you get high peaks of pressure, the wheels dig into the ground more, which means the tank is working harder to move across the ground, and particularly when it's trying to turn. So it's having to work harder. Um, and you can shed tracks and other things. Cause, and, and, and the track tends to last shorter distances because it's receiving more stress from these peaks of pressure and these lateral forces when you're trying to turn the track. So, so it's often simplistic to look at a track's width and infer the ground pressure from the, from the width of the track. If you have a few small wheels, you're going to have very high peaks of pressure, which you can alleviate a little with wide tracks, but there's diminishing returns to that. You're still going to have high peaks of pressure. So the Germans have big wheels, and they, which closes the gap between wheels. If you have big wheels, it closes the gap. So you're, you're shortening the distance between the wheels. That spreads the load better. And then you have interleaved wheels, which is closing that gap further. So if you have smaller gaps between the peaks of pressure, you're reducing the peaks of pressure. That's one of the reasons why the Tiger tank is so agile while it floats beautifully over the soil. You can see that at Tankfest when Tiger 131 uh, is running. But sorry, not, not Tankfest anymore, Tiger Days when it's running. Um, it just uh, it just floats over the soil. So soil flotation, by the way, is a technical term. I'm not I'm not implying that it floats on water or something. It, it floats beautifully on the soil. It has such uh, such low peaks of pressure that it it makes it makes its turns with very little effort. Right? You also have that rege regenerative st steering, which helps. But it has, independent of the, of the regenerative steering, it has beautiful soil flotation. Now, you compare something like the KV-1, early cruiser tanks, very high peaks of pressure. Whenever they turn, they dig up the soil. So they throw up the soil out the side. I don't mean out the back of the tracks. They throw it up out the side because those peaks of pressure are digging up the soil and throwing it out the side, it's digging into the ground. So they made this deliberate choice. And it is true that then you've got high material costs because now you've, you've, you've got to make all these wheels and you have, maintain, you have an accessibility problem too, which, which speaks to the maintainability of the Tiger Tank. Those, those inner wheels are less accessible than the outer ones. Um, and there's some um, user reports I quote in here where it, it can take hours just to get to an inner wheel. So if you have an inner weight wheel failure, just to get to that inner wheel is going to take you hours because you have to jack it up. You have to remove those outer wheels. You have to, maybe that inner wheel is jammed. You have to release it, put a new wheel on and, and, and reverse the process, right? So that's a cost. But this is the thing with tanks, right? You, you're always trading off capabilities with cost. If you want a good tank, you're going to have to pay for it. And, and, and that's uh, a, a trade-off that is often is easy to forget if you just read the propaganda, because the propaganda is, is framed as, you know, think how, think how stupid the Germans were that they built this costly tank, it's too heavy, um, it's too slow, and all these other things which are myths. And they're missing the point. You're going to have to pay for high capabilities, and the Germans paid for it, and they killed a lot of allied personnel, our compatriots and, and ancestors, uh, because of different capability choices by the respective sides.